Agriculture can save the world if they just give us a chance. All our legislators are doing everything they can to put us out of business. It's death by a thousand cuts. Governor Jerry Brown today signed a bill regulating emissions from dairy cows. The law requires a 40% reduction in emissions by 2030. I love campaigning against the Green New Deal. No more airplanes, no more cows. People have ignored the impacts of the meat and dairy industry for such a long time because it's politically challenging. Nobody wants to be told to eat less meat. I'm Ali. And I'm Sutton. We came to California with a methane camera, which we hoped would be able to capture flatulence. Uh, yeah, just kidding. We got it to talk about cow burps. I thought it might actually be both ends of the cow. It turns out it's just burps. It's mainly just the burps. Yeah. Which is the way that cows emit methane, which accelerates global warming. Methane, uh, over a 100-year period of time, is about 28 to 32 times more uh, potent than carbon dioxide. And that's the reason why we're trying to find new biological ways to decrease methane production from cows. Scientists around the world have been adding things to cows' diets to make them less gassy. Citrus, nutmeg, oregano, and research from Australia and now California shows that the answer may lie at the bottom of the ocean. To think that I could potentially contribute to massive reductions in greenhouse gas emissions through the livestock industry by growing a seaweed, it just got me really excited. The most important thing that people have to do every single day when they wake up is eat. To me, the most important industry in the United States is the production of food and fiber. So I'm a fourth generation Californian. My grandfather was a cowboy, so it's kind of in our blood, it's in our veins. We run about 800 cows on about 15,000 acres. Because of climate change, we're dealing with weather extremes every year. There's no such thing as a normal year in California anymore. I like to think that we're forward-thinking ranchers. Scott and his family try to ranch as environmentally as possible, composting and putting a conservation easement on their rangeland to prevent any future development. Out of the 2.5 million dairy and beef cattle in California, Scott's herd of 800 is just a drop in the bucket. We keep a small amount through our own grass-finished beef program, but the majority of our cattle go to feedlots in California. Harris Ranch is one of the buyers of our cattle. Harris Ranch is the largest cattle operation in the state. We went on a road trip to see their feedlot, which can hold up to 250,000 cows. It's just off the highway in Kaolinga. While they declined to comment, they have a hotel and a restaurant just down the highway, and we talked to some of their customers. I got a top sirloin filet mignon. It's pretty good beef. It's tasty. I know it takes a lot of energy to raise cows. I personally have made a choice to really cut back on eating meat. Human nature. He's like a lion. He has to kill to survive. Yeah, I've been hearing a lot about the methane gas tax or something like that. And I think, you know, it's a way of life. In addition to the beef industry, California is America's largest dairy state. A lobbyist for the dairy industry explained that because cow manure also contains methane, dairies can reduce their methane emissions through, quote, alternative manure management. We're also developing digesters, which are designed to capture methane from dairies and put it to productive use. Things like transportation fuel that can be used to replace diesel and heavy duty trucks. The beef industry, on the other hand, they can't collect and process manure as easily because those grass fed cows, they roam. In other words, methane reduction would have to come from the animals themselves. And so, scientists from UC Davis are trying to reduce the methane in cow burps. I grew up in uh, Eritrea. In East Africa, and I, I really got interested in uh, livestock very early on. UC Davis has the, the number one ranked uh, College of Agriculture and Environmental Science in the, in the United States. We've been doing uh, animal trials with Dr. Cabra for about four years now, looking at overall animal health with feed additives, and now with my PhD, we're looking at reducing greenhouse gas emissions from both beef and dairy cattle. The research actually began with Australian-based Dr. Rob Kinley, who was visiting UC Davis on the day we were filming. 
While working in Atlantic Canada, a farmer asked Dr. Kinley to analyze what health benefits might come from feeding seaweed to cows. And Dr. Kinley discovered that it also reduced their methane. What's interesting to me in this study is the length of it. Mm. So this yes. will be the longest exposure mm -hmm. to the seaweed of any of the studies so far. Yeah. We were able to get enough seaweed from Australia to start our trial. Each steer has its own feed bucket. This one's done. And then we'll go ahead and hand mix in the seaweed. Someone's not happy this morning. The only difference between our control and treatment groups is the seaweed itself. Dr. Kabrab conducted his first seaweed trial in 2018 with 12 dairy cows, and the milk tasted the same. With the beef steers, he and his team are trying two different concentrations of the seaweed additive, which they first tested in the lab. We have an artificial cow gut in our laboratory. Anyone can reduce methane. <laughs> it's actually pretty easy to do. You just kill all the microbes. But when you do that, you harm the animal. So we needed to make sure that the animal's not losing any type of efficiency as well. Just like the cow gets its breakfast every day, we remove one of these and then we can replace the new feed inside the system. If I would have to estimate how many seaweeds we have tested in the laboratory, I would guess somewhere between 20 and 50. Who's your seaweed dealer? <laughs> Amazon. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be amazed what you can find on Amazon. This one particular one seemed very promising. It's Asparagopsis taxiformis. Crunching the data, we were seeing about 98% reduction. How well it worked was a real surprise. We saw about 25% reduction when we use half a percent, 60% reduction when we use 1%. I was very, very surprised to see uh, such a drastic uh, reduction in, in methane emissions. I think we would, we would see further reductions with higher concentrates. And I, I think so. We'll continue a thousand head trial. All we need is a thousand head worth of seaweed. Yeah. <laughs> and there lies the problem. No one has found a way to farm Asparagopsis taxiformis, especially at the scale required to feed all the cows in California or the world. That's what led us to Jen Smith, a professor at the University of California, San Diego. So I remember sometime last summer coming across a news article that was referring to the use of a particular red seaweed in mitigating cow burps, and I found that immediately fascinating because I'm quite familiar with that species of seaweed. We find it here in San Diego, as well as on our offshore islands, San Clemente and Catalina Island, where it grows quite abundantly. So we came to Catalina Island today to find some Asparagopsis in the wild. Nobody has ever completed the life cycle in captivity, so it's not like we just can start growing it immediately at scale tomorrow. The seaweed that I have growing in the lab right now is one particular phase of this Asparagopsis. It's known as the sporophyte. When you look at it microscopically, you can see chains of cells. It's a very simple growth form, and it grows quite readily from fragmentations. You can take any one of these little puff balls and cut it into multiple pieces, and each one of those pieces can continue to grow. By changing things like the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that you give it, you can double the amount of bromoform concentration, and bromoform is one of the chemicals that is active at reducing methane production in cattle. Ultimately, with seaweed that has been wild harvested, it's not a sustainable practice. I think it's viable for short-term studies in order to move the research forward with the livestock, but there's a lot of science that needs to be done in order to figure out how do we move from cultivating it in the laboratory to cultivating it outside in tanks or potentially even in the open ocean, which I believe is much farther down the road. There are a few seaweed products already on the market from Canada for ranchers to use once their cows come off the grazing lands but they're expensive and very niche. We're trying to do the best we can. We're working with some of the dried sea kelp. We're trying to do it for better health for our animals. And there's some side benefits with the methane emission reductions. Does it cost more? Is it hard to get? Yes. And I'm willing to go to those steps to see what we can do. 
If we don't take care of these rangelands where we make our living, what kind of legacy are we going to leave for our kids? The Western cowboy life is kind of a disappearing breed. In some aspects, the industry has almost become demonized. When we have legislators passing these laws, nobody ever comes out and does a fiscal analysis on how it's going to affect the people that produce the food and fiber. We're asking to be left alone and let us do what we do best and feed the world. It's not only politicians that are putting pressure on the industry. The financial world is also speaking up. 80 investors managing over $6.5 trillion in assets have asked the world's top fast food companies like McDonald's, Wendy's, Chipotle, Burger King, Domino's, and KFC to set emissions targets in line with the Paris Agreement. Pressure from investors is a very good catalyst for companies. Aviva is Britain's largest insurance company. We have around $430 billion of assets under management. And we've also had more exposure to the impacts of climate change through our insurance business. We are shareholders in these six fast food companies, which means we're part owners of them. Companies need to also take their own responsibility and realize that when they are at the scale that they are at, like McDonald's, which is one of the biggest beef purchases in the world, even tiny steps they take can have huge impacts, much, much bigger, much wider impacts than individuals. We reached out to all six companies targeted by this initiative. So far, only McDonald's and KFC's parent company, Yum Brands, have agreed to set emissions targets. And most of the other companies that we are targeting have very little, particularly Wendy's and Domino's Pizza, a little disappointing. While Wendy's didn't get back to us, Domino's says they're planning to engage with investors. Back at UC Davis, beef and dairy companies have started to reach out to Dr. Kabrab and his team. It makes sense for companies that are selling uh, meat and, and milk products, if we can keep the, the levels that we're seeing in this experiment, 60% is quite a big number. Ha <laughs> ha!